Amen. Amen. Praise God. An incredible God that we do serve. Amen. Amen. You can sit there and patty cake them all you want to. But let me tell you, it is not until you have found yourself in some situations where you cannot Come on. Uh, figure out which way is up. Not, not even figuring out how you're going to get out of it, just figuring out where you stand and where you are until you experience God like that. Oh my Come Lord! On. I I try, I I I need someone that can testify that you weren't Come paying on. attention to where you were going, had no clue about your surroundings, did not know the death that was laying and and wait for you. But right when you should have died, God protected you and kept you. I, 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 I need someone, amen, praise God, that uh, uh, knew that the bill collector had every right to come back and get everything. Not just some things, everything. But at the right moment, at the right time, God blessed you with the finances to, to hold the bill collector off for another 30 days. See, the problem is we're looking for the resurrected Lazarus or the resurrected uh, uh, son of the widow. We're looking for the multiplied bread and fish. We're looking to see God transform dirty, used water into wine, not realizing that every blessing of God, no matter if we think it's big or small, is a great blessing of God. And the fact that he woke you up this morning, he kept you here, he kept you in this place, is more than enough to justify your praise, more than enough for you to say he is an incredible God. Amen. Praise God. Oh, you don't have to uh, praise with me. I I'll do it by myself. Amen. Because I know just how good my God has been, not just to me, but he's been to you. In fact, let me go ahead and tell you, share with you. Amen. Amen. You can zoom in on me. Amen. Praise God. I washed my face this morning. Amen. Uh, uh, but I pray for each and every one of you every single day. I pray for every single one of you, each and every day. I pray that God will forgive you of your sins. I pray that God will protect you and provide for you. I pray that he will keep you from all hurt, harm, uh, injury, and death. I pray that God would do an amazing and an incredible thing with you. And the fact that I see you here today sitting in this sanctuary with me for the fact that I know, because I can see down here on my phone, amen, I've got uh, uh, the analytics on my phone right now. I can see who's online and who is not. And for the simple fact that you have decided to join us today means that God has done an incredible thing by keeping you and blessing you. Amen. Amen. Let me jump into my sermon because I know, amen, we want to be out of here in a certain time. We don't want to be here all day long in the church. Amen. With that said, do, go, do me this favor. Go with me to the gospel of John. Amen. We're going to turn to the 19th chapter, the gospel of John. Amen. Praise God. We're going to look at verses 28 through 29. Amen. The gospel of John, verses 28 through 29. If you do not have it, we have it on the screen for you. Reading from the New Revised Standard Version of the Scripture, the Word of God reads as follows. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said in order to fulfill the Scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so the Roman soldiers put a sponge full of wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to 
to his mouth. Thus far the word of God, he may be seated in his presence. Amen. Amen. Again, after this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So the Roman soldiers put a sponge full of wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. Amen. Amen. The title of our sermon this morning is At the Cross, Part 4, Distress. At the Cross, Part 4, Distress. Dear Father God, creator of the heavens and the earth, God, we thank you for this day, for this is the day, God, that you have made. We are glad. We are rejoicing in it. Father, we pray at this time, at this moment, that, God, you would inhabit this worthless, raggedy, beat-down, uh, uh, valueless, uh, crap flower pot, and that, God, you would shine your grace and mercy upon me. God, find me suitable for the moment to declare your word. Inhabit me, God. Fill me. Permeate me, God. Rest, rule, and abide in me so that it is not me that speaks, but it is your Holy Spirit that speaks through me. God, give us this word that we need so that we may go out here to this week and be the disciples and stewards that you've called us to be. Father God, we thank you for choosing us. We thank you for loving us. Now, God, be praised in us and through us. It's in your son's mighty matchless, marvelous, and magnificent name that we do pray. Amen. 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 Um, the fourth saying, amen, we've been looking at the last seven sayings of Jesus while he was on the cross. The fourth saying this morning is the saying that Jesus made while he was on the cross. He said at some point, I and thirsty, or if you're reading the King James Version, I think it says, I thirst. Uh, how, whatever version you're reading, uh, it really uh, doesn't matter because the gist is the same. Jesus declares in a loud voice for all to hear at Golgotha underneath that cross that he was hurt was was thirsty now normally when we hear someone say that they are thirsty we are assuming that they're talking about a physical desire to quench thirst amen that they have expended energy physical energy in such a large amount that they their body in response has become thirsty amen ask an athlete what is what i'm talking about that playing a game whether it's football basketball soccer volleyball tennis the physical exertion of energy produces a physical need to consume water or other beverages to replace the the, the water to replace the fluids in your body if, if, if you don't believe me ask any one of these brothers and sisters that we see working hard Monday through Friday at, on some manual labor job at some construction site working on the side of the road digging dish, di ditches anytime you expand labor you develop thirst I'm not even gonna lie to you there are many Sundays that I cannot wait to get out the pulpit because simply preaching produces a physical thirst thirst within me that I'm looking for my cup of water that is sitting in my office sitting back there with that ice in it and I cannot wait for that ice cold water to quench my thirst amen Jesus says from the cross that he was thirsty 
and the Roman soldiers that are assigned to guard him, to keep him up on the cross and keep everyone else away from the cross, they heard what he said and they assumed that, uh, that Jesus was, was in need of, of physically in need of a beverage to drink, that his, his body needed fluids. And so what they did, they, 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 there was, they looked around, there was a bottle of sour wine at Golgotha, at the place of the cross. And they took a sponge, they dipped it in the wine, they put it on a branch of hyssop, and they gave it to Jesus. They gave it to him thinking that they were going to uh, 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 help him relieve his thirst. They assumed uh, that the crucifixion had drawn out so much energy that Jesus was asserting, exerting so much energy just to breathe uh, that he was thirsting. In fact, let me talk to you about that, that crucifixion. Here's the thing, believe it or not, uh, uh, crucifixion is a cruel process. And let me tell you why it's so cruel. In crucifixion, your arms are stretched wide, okay? Now, I know some of us may say, what's the big deal, Pastor? I can stretch my arms wide right now. In fact, you're stretching your arm wide. Why is that so cruel? Because the body is not meant to hold his arms out for long times. That's why when we're not doing anything, our arms naturally lie down. Amen. And so what happens when you put someone on the cross, you put their, and got their arms spread out, it adds pressure to the uh, chest, neck, and back. And if you leave someone up there long enough, what happens, your chest muscles, your neck muscles, and your back muscles, they go into shock. And when they go into shock, the first thing they do is that they release what they're holding. Amen. Your diaphragm has the sole responsibility of pushing on your lungs. Your diaphragm, as long as, along with the muscles in your chest, neck, and back, they squeeze and they press and they release on your lungs. And when they do that, that causes your lungs to uh, contract and expand. That's how we breathe. But here's the thing. Your diaphragm is not capable of supporting everything that's inside your chest. It's only there to push on your lungs. So when your chest muscles, your neck muscles, your back muscles, when they spasm, when they give out, they release organs that drop. When your chest, when the lungs in your chest drop, they drop below the muscles that are designed to squeeze them and compress them. What that happens, it becomes harder and harder for you to breathe. To, to breathe, you have to expend greater and greater amounts of effort, of energy. And, and so what the Roman soldiers were assuming was, they were assuming that Jesus was a spend a lot of effort, a lot of energy to just breathe, and as such, he became thirsty. That's what they thought. That's what they assumed. But I want to challenge that assumption today. I, 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 want, I want us to question if Jesus was really thirsty, amen. I, I, I told you last week, and I've told you on previous occasion that many times, many times, Scripture has both a literal surface meaning and then a deeper figurative meaning. And that many times when we read scripture, we're too quick to read through it, to run through it without sitting there giving it any more time 
than what is necessary to simply read it quickly. And when we do that, we miss out on some things. And there's something that we're, going, we're missing out on. And I want to show it to you because I want to show you what God showed me. Amen. Amen. Give me my first point because I feel myself going right into the first point. Amen. The first point is the Roman soldiers misunderstood Jesus' need. Amen. Amen. Praise God. The Roman soldiers misunderstood Jesus' need. They heard Jesus say, I am thirsty, and they immediately assumed that Jesus needed a beverage. He needed water. He needed Diet Coke. He needed fruit punch. He needed Gatorade. He needed something to replace his electrolytes. That is not what Jesus was saying at that moment. Amen. Praise God. What Jesus was saying was something deeper. And the reason why it was deeper is because of the verb being used for thirst. Amen. Praise God. You know, I forgot, Pastor, I forgot to ask my questions. Amen. I had some questions. Amen. And it's necessary for me to ask some for these points. So let me move, go back for a second. Amen. There's some questions I want to ask. And I think you should be asking too, because when you read the scripture, these things should jump out to you. Amen. The, the, the word said that Jesus says he's thirsty. And, uh, and the first thing the Roman soldiers give him is sour wine. No one had any water. No, no one there had any water? That's the first question. Two, uh, you gave him sour wine? What was sour wine doing at the cross? Okay, I'm, I'm going to deal with each of these. And then last but not least, what does Jesus mean when he is saying he's thirsty? So, the first point is the Roman soldiers misunderstood Jesus. Amen. They misunderstood he was saying he was thirsty. And I'm telling you, the way we know he mis they misunderstood him is because of the verb being used there. Amen. Now, I know when you read your scripture, when you read your Bible, it says thirst. And in your mind, you're saying, okay, Pastor Al, that's, that's rather clear to me. There, there, there's, there's no question what thirst means. The problem is we're reading an English translation of a scripture that was originally written in, in, in Greek. And in Greek, the word that your English translators have translated thirst is the word dipseol. Okay? Dipseol does is used when someone says thirst however it's not used as we think it is there's another greek word that was used when someone said that they were physically thirsty that they needed a beverage they needed water to replace the fluids and electrolytes in their body that's another word when they when when the you when a speaker said use the greek verb to sell he was saying or she was saying that that person longed for something ephemeral, ephemeral, something uh, intangible, something uh, uh, that is not easily uh, gotten or received. Amen. It was normally used in such that I thirst for love. I thirst for companionship. I thirst for relationship. In fact, in, in Matthew chapter 5, when Jesus is giving uh, the Sermon on the Mount and he starts with those Beatitudes, amen. He says, Bless, one of the uh, Beatitudes is, Bless are those who thirst for justice and righteousness, for they shall be filled. When he says, blessed are those who thirst, he's using the same word, dipsal. It's used to speak metaphorically, to speak figuratively about longing for something. And in this case, Jesus is longing for something. He's longing for something that is not present right there, right then, at 
the cross. And the problem is the Roman soldiers who've been assigned to attend to him do not understand that he's asking for something they cannot give. Amen. Amen. In fact, let me, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me talk to you. Amen. Don't be the Roman soldiers. Don't be so literal. Don't be so disconnected and disconcerned that when God says that he, he dips sales for justice, dips sales for equality, dips sales for a lot of things, you think he's saying he's thirsty for water or thirsty for coffee or tea. God is saying he is thirsty for a great number of things in this world and he's calling us to fulfill it. We have to be careful that we stay so connected with God that we understand what it is he's saying when he says it. And nothing worse than here it is, you're trying to talk to somebody, trying to tell someone, and you're saying something, they don't get it. Amen, amen. He, you, you, you sitting in mind. And they're like, what? Huh? You, you ever been, you, you trying to tell someone. And they're like, huh? That, 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 that's the Roman soldiers. That's us. They didn't understand that Jesus is longing for righteousness. He's longing for justice. He's longing to see this thing come to pass. Amen. Amen. Now, amen. That's our first point. Amen. Let me get to the second point because I really want to get to the second point. Amen. Uh, the first point was that the Roman soldiers misunderstood what Jesus needed. The second point, the presence of wine along with hyssop at Calvary is meant to signify the preserving and purifying presence of the Lord God Almighty. The presence of wine along with hyssop at Calvary is meant to signify the preserving and purifying presence of the Lord God Almighty. Now, remember one of the questions I said that we need to be mindful of, one of the questions I, I mentioned that you need to be thinking of is why in the world was there wine at the cross? Okay. Please understand that just like today, wine during antiquity was used for celebratory purposes. That whenever people got together for a party, an anniversary, a retirement, a birth, they drank wine. Amen. Praise God. Wine, a, a, a wine was used to signify the occasion. It was used to mark the occasion. Amen. Amen. This is why uh, when Jesus went to the banquet in Canaan, they were serving wine. This is why the, uh, uh, the host uh, uh, felt out of whack, out of sorts when they ran out of wine, and this is why the guests were thought the host was withholding the best wine from them when Jesus transformed the water to wine. Because wine, it was understood at a banquet, you didn't serve goat's milk, you didn't serve cow's milk, you didn't sell, serve juice, and you didn't serve water, you served wine. All right. When Jesus, when the Pharisees come to Jesus' disciples and question the disciples about Jesus' intent and sincerity as a rabbi, uh, that's because they saw Jesus sitting in the house, in Matthew's house, with sinners, with tax collectors, with prostitutes, with all kind of persons that done wrong, that had done wrong, drinking wine. Amen. Praise God. When, when uh, it comes time for Jesus to institute the Lord's Supper, the Last Supper, Holy Communion, whatever you call it, he implements it with wine. It's celebration. It's supposed to be celebratory. When we take communion, we're supposed to celebrate what God accomplished on the cross that day at Calvary. Wine is a good thing. Amen. Come on, saints. Stop acting like you ain't drinking wine. Amen. Praise God. Amen. 
Some of you I know are experts at wine. You know the difference between Merlot, Cabernet, and Sauvignon. Amen. There's no need to pretend like I'm speaking a different language, that I'm speaking tongues. The only tongues I'm speaking is the same tongue you, t you speak at home. When you grab your glass, you pour your glass of wine, you get on the phone with your girlfriends, and you watch the housewife show, or you watch the red carpet to the Oscars tonight. Come on, tell the truth. I know what's going to happen. Amen. I've got a wife. Amen. She does the same thing with her girlfriends. It's celebratory. Wine is celebratory. But where's the celebration at Golgotha? Where's the joy? Where's the happiness at Golgotha? This is a place of death, a place of mourning, a place of weeping. In fact, we talked about last week how uh, Jesus' mother, his Aunt Mary, and Mary of Magdalene and the beloved disciple are standing there uh, underneath the cross, and they're weeping. They're weeping because Jesus is dying. Why then would there be wine at the cross? Well, here's the thing. Here's a little piece of history for you. There's wine at the cross because wine has several purposes. It just was not for celebrating birthdays, anniversary, weddings, and whatever. Wine was also a poor, it's medicinal. It was a poor man's embalming fluid. All right? So what they would do, they would not use good wine because you never use good wine for purposes like that. Come on, folks. Come on, members. Help me out. When the last time you out there using your good wine for something bad? Amen. But look at, look at Deacon Styles. Deacon Styles, like, mm -mm, I ain't using my good wine for something bad. Amen. I'll use the bad wine for something, but you ain't going to use my good wine. A -a Amen. You don't use the good wine on a body that has been brutalized, been scarred, been marred. But if you have had sour wine. And you got to remember during this day, they didn't have refrigerators. They didn't have deep freezers. They didn't have wine coolers. So it was quite possible that if you didn't drink your wine fast enough, amen, praise God, that, that uh, your wine went bad and they didn't throw wine away because they knew even bad wine had a purpose. I felt, oh, let that, oh, that's a word, Pastor. Uh, oh, God. Mm, that even when things are bad, they still have a purpose. Even when things have lost, have moved past their expiration date, they still can serve a purpose just because because it's bad doesn't mean it can't uh, help you or bless you. Amen. Last time I checked, the best fertilizer in the world was not those granular uh, uh, seeds that I pick up from Lowe's or Home Depot. The best fertilizer in the world was what came out the rear end of a cow, a dog, or a pig. Any other time, we think it's bad, but hey, but but put that fertilizer or, or from from that from that animal down there on that crop, and watch your crop be bigger, sweeter, and better tasting than it's ever been. So they 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 would take the sour wine and they would take it to places like uh, Golgotha or places where uh, persons die, because that they would use that as a cheap man's embalming fluid. Okay, and it was meant to preserve the body for burial because Jews had this ritual where the body would not be put in the ground for four days. That's because the Jews believed that the spirit stayed in the body for three days. And so until uh, the spirit left the body, you did not put the body in the ground because you may be putting a live person, burying a live person in a tomb. And so they would use the wine to embalm the body. Amen. But here, notice what happens in the scripture when Jesus says that he is uh, 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 thirsty. They, they dip the sponge in the sour wine and then they put it on a branch of hyssop. 
Again, I keep telling you, nothing that's in the Bible is in there by accident. Everything is on purpose. See, we run through that. We run through that too fast, and we don't realize that it's significant that the sponge with the wine has been put on a branch of hyssop. All right, you, let, 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 me help, let, me, let me help you get this. Uh, amen. If you go back to Old Testament, amen, praise God, when it was time for persons, to bring their offering to the temple to atone for their sin, to remove the stain of guilt from them. They brought an animal where they slayed the animal and the animal's blood was collected in a bowl. Where in the bowl was either ground up hyssop leaves or the abstract oil from the hyssop bush. The hyssop bush, it's a shrub-like bush. It was used in religious per, in religious ceremonial uh, ceremony in, in, in Jewish, in the Jewish religion. It was thought to be a cleanser, a purifying agent. Amen. It was thought to 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 be, uh, in fact, it had a bitter taste. Uh, if you got it in an open cut, it stung. Uh, it, 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 it hurt. Uh, but the thought was it, it was that much pain because it had that much cleansing power, purifying power. And so when they would catch the blood falling from the sacrificial animal and they in the bowl they will miss it with hyssop then they will take a branch of hyssop uh, with the leaves and the priest would dip the branch with the leaves in the mixture of blood and hyssop and then walk around the four sides of the altar sprinkling the altar with this blood hyssop mixture. Once they did that, they would then sprinkle the offerer with the blood hyssop mixture. The whole idea was that the thought was that here uh, the, the offerer had brought his or her sin, they had put it on God's off, all, altar, and the moment God's altar touched that animal with all that sin, it became ceremonially unclean, and the way to make it ceremonially clean again was to make sure that there was hyssop put on the altar and the person making the offering. Okay, I, you're going to get this in a second. You're going you to like this. Here's the thing. The Roman soldiers assumed that Jesus was physically thirsty and trying to be mean, trying to make a joke, trying to ridicule him, they thought they were going to get a sponge, pour sour wine on the sponge, and then serve it to him on the end of a branch of hyssop. What they didn't realize was that God was in the midst of purifying Jesus. He was purifying the offering that Jesus was making on the cross. You got to realize the cross becomes God's new altar. And when Jesus is nailed to the cross, all our sins are nailed to the cross. And if God doesn't purify the cross, then what happens, the cross becomes something Something ceremonially unclean. And if it's ceremonially unclean, we can't have it standing back here behind me on the wall. But what God did, God used a folly of man, the foolishness of man, the evil vindictiveness of man to bring about his purpose. What he did, he got uh, uh, the soldiers to take that uh, sponge full of sour wine and to lift it up on the bread of hyssop, and what happened, they held it to his mouth. Now, the word doesn't say he drank it. It just said it touched his body. M remember what I told you about the priest walking around sprinkling hyssop and blood on the altar and the, and the offerer. Here's the thing. When, 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 when uh, uh, they uh, lifted the sponge, they had to break a branch of hyssop a branch off the hyssop shrub. So what happened when they stuck the end, the broken piece of the uh, branch into the spud and they put it up there to him, the wine and the oil from the spun mints. And remember what God, Jesus said, here, drink from this cup, this cup of wine. This is my blood shed for the New Testament. We got a blood hyssop mixture that 
purified the cross, and it just didn't purify the cross. It purified Jesus, and because Jesus stood there in our gap, stood there in our place, then what happened by uh, osmosis, by association, we were purified too. Oh, someone ought to celebrate the Lord God Almighty, because if it had not been for Jesus on our side, you would not have the right to even come to the corner of this property because your sins, your wrongdoing, your shortcomings, your failings, the way you fall, fail would have kept you out of this place. It would have made you unworthy to come before God. But God knowing that we needed something and someone to purify us, to preserve us, to cleanse us, to make us presentable before his throne. God sent Jesus to be on the throne and to be there um, so that we could be purified and preserved and cleansed and purged so that when the time came when we will walk into the house of God, we will be able to walk in and to worship him in spirit and in truth. God was preserving and purifying both the offering and the offerer. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Uh, uh, um, uh, give me my third point because before I jump into it, amen. The Roman soldiers misunderstood Jesus' need. That's the first point. Second point, the presence of wine along with hyssop at Calvary is meant to signify the preserving and purifying presence of the Lord God Almighty. Ed, Jesus thirsted so that scripture may be fulfilled. Now, I know you're sitting there trying to figure out what do I mean when scripture may be fulfilled. Here's the thing about scripture. Scripture always serves two points, Sister Ramona. Amen. When we read our Bibles, it serves two points. The first thing, point that it serves, the first purpose that it serves, is it gives us a historical record of what God has already done. Amen. In fact, for some of us, some of us are able to shout on what God has already done. Amen. That we are able to look at the scripture and read the scripture and see what God did for some character that looks like us, sounds like us, talks like us, walks like us, breathes like us, eats like us, sleeps like us, acts like us. And we're able to shout because we see what God has done and we take it on faith that if God did it for them, he will do it for us. So we, we, we love the historical record record that God provides us uh, uh, through scripture. That's one purpose that scripture fulfills. But remember, I told you there are two purposes that scripture fills. Amen. Fulfills. Amen. And the first purpose is the historical record. The second purpose, though, is the prophecy of things to come. Okay. See, y'all missed that. All right. Let me. Okay. Amen. When we read scripture, it looks like it's cast in the past tense. But anyone who is walking by faith sees scripture not just only as a historical record of what God already did, but you see it as a promise of what he's going to do. Amen. If it's a promise of what he's going to do, and we believe that God's word is such that it cannot come back to him void, and he's not a man that he shall lie, or a son of man, or his promise that his promises shall fail, and that we believe that all scripture is breathed upon, then that means any promise of what he's going to do is in actuality a prophecy. Amen. Amen. Let me go ahead and talk to some prophets here today. Amen. When you tell me that you're going to meet me here uh, to do for a meeting or to do service, you are prophesying about uh, what your future is going to be. What you're telling me is that you are declaring right now in the present that sometime in the future, you're going to come be in this place, occupy this space, and do a certain thing. Well, that's what Scripture does. Uh, scripture says that at this present time, we have an 
indication. We have a promise. We have a guarantee that there is more that God is going to do, that God is going to fulfill some things in our, in, in our lives, and that all we have to do is hold on to it. That's the prophecy, the prophetic part, the second purpose of Scripture. Now, I know you may be saying, okay, Pastor Al, why are you going through all this? Because you said that uh, that Jesus thirsts to fulfill the scripture. I don't see any scripture that needed to be fulfilled uh, other than Jesus' own proclamation that he was going to die on the cross. Well, here's the thing. Let me let me educate you. Let me teach you. And uh, in fact, fact, the old people say, let me learn just something. Amen. Praise God. Go with me to Psalm 69. Amen. Psalm 69, verse 21. It reads, it's a Psalm of David. It reads uh, from the king. It says, uh, uh, they, they fed me food that was poisoned, and they made me drink sour wine. Okay, amen. Okay, let me, let me, let me help you with this. Because I know what you're thinking. Wait a second, Pastor Al. That's David commenting on what he had been through. Yes, David is commenting on what he's been through. David, amen. We're going to talk about Psalm 22 next week. Amen. Praise God, because God's got something incredible for us next week. But many of the Psalms that David records, he records those Psalms to reflect what he had been through in his life. Sister Danita, the man had been through some hard times. Amen. Run DMC had nothing on day, uh, on King David. He had been through some hard times. He had suffered. People tried to kill him, tried to hurt him, tried to harm him, tried to mistreat him, tried to abuse him, tried to poison him. They tried to do everything they could to take him out because what happened, people wanted what David had. Come on, someone. You should understand what I'm saying because you too know that you've been in some situations where persons have wanted what you've had. They wanted your spouse. They wanted your children. They wanted your house. They wanted your car. They wanted the clothes on your body. They wanted the few dollars and few pennies in your wallet. They wanted the job position you held. They wanted the places of significance and influence that you, uh, the power uh, that you apparently have. They wanted what you have and what they did they tried to kill you they tried to destroy you to take from you that which you had David in the Psalms re talks about this at length uh, how they went about trying to harm him and in Psalm 69 verse 21 we're told exactly one of the ways that they tried to harm him they poisoned his food and they made him drink sour wine now remember I told Told you that scripture is both a historical record and a prophecy. See, the problem is we read Psalm 69 verse 21 as if it's simply a historical record. What we did not realize was David was just not talking about what literally happened to him. He was talking about what was figuratively going to happen to God's Messiah. That the day was going to come. He didn't know when that day was going to come. He don't. He didn't know where. where it would happen, but he knew the day was going to come sometime in the future where God's Messiah was going to come down to earth. And when God's Messiah came to earth, that the people were going to mistreat him like they mistreat, they mistreat the Messiah like they mistreated him. They were going to try to kill the Messiah like they tried to kill him. They were going to lie on the Messiah like they lied on him. They were going to brutalize the Messiah like they brutalized him. They were going to try to poison the Messiah like they poisoned him and they were going to try to make him drink sour wine like they made King David drink sour wine. And so what we have is a prophetic word from the king about the king to come. Oh, I wish you could get this. Come on, king and queen. God is using you to speak a prophetic word over someone else's life. Now here's the thing. Once God speaks a prophetic word or had you usher up a prophetic word, it's not a prophecy until, unless it comes true. Because when a prophecy doesn't come true, what do we say? It was a lie. And the person was a false prophet. So if David is going to be the prophet that God has called him to be, then God has to bring to pass what 
David prophesied way back then. So when David says they fed me poison food and they made me drink sour wine, that had to come to pass with the Messiah. So this is why Jesus declares, I am thirsty. It's not that he needed water. It's not that he needed a uh, beverage to live, but Jesus understood that his job his sole purpose was to fulfill scripture. It was to realize that what God had promised in the scripture. And one of the things that he promised in the scripture was that the Messiah would drink sour wine, that will be given sour wine. Jesus doesn't drink it, but he doesn't stop them from touching his body with it because that's the fulfillment of scripture. Let me help someone out here today. The reason why you are going through the reason why you are experiencing some things that you're experiencing today because God is has spoken prophetically over you he didn't speak prophetically over you just so that you will experience the problem he spoke prophetically over you so that you can see his goodness and his greatness in the midst of the problem this is why the problem came it ain't to punish you it ain't to inflict harm or or danger upon you it said it's a setup for God to show out in your life. Too many times you and me, we get upset with God. We get our backs blown out. We act like we are feeling some kind of way because we think God has forsaken and abandoned us. He hasn't forsaken us. He hasn't abandoned us. He's been prophetic to us. And that if the problem can arise, so can the praise. That if God can bring the predicament in our lives, so can he fulfill the promise. And what what you have to do is stop being so caught up on what the problem and the predicament is and be caught up on the praise of the promise. I, I, amen. I, I, I wish I had more time. I don't have it. I've only got six minutes left, Sean, and you're encouraging me to go there. Amen. So why don't I just go there? Why don't I get to the celebration so that I can finish this and you can still get home and get all that fried chicken that Sister Carol is making for you. Amen. Praise God. Here's the thing. Jesus says he's thirsty. Gee, the people are mistreating him. We would think that when we see that, we would think, okay, why then would God want to forgive us? Why then would God want to uh, 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 die for us if we mistreated him like that? If we, excuse me, if we brutalized him, if we lied on him, that we scandalized his name that we uh, tortured him, that we sullied him, that, that we did all this. Why would he want to do this for us? Uh, because we sit there in our own feelings. Come on, tell the truth, Sister Hattie. If you cross me once, and definitely if you cross me twice, there would not be a third time. Because guess what, Hattie? We from New York City. Amen. We don't play in New York City. Amen. Amen. A a a mess, with, mess with us if you want to. You will uh, pull back a nub. You will pull back a laceration, a gash, and some stitches. You may even pull back a gunshot wound. Amen. Because that is just how crazy we are from New York City. Amen. I know someone said, wait a second, Pastor, I thought you grew up in Charlotte. No, I grew up in New York City. Amen. I'm like my son. Amen. When we drive down past downtown and my daughter, they holler out, there's New York City. Amen. Because all they see is tall buildings. I'm like, I'm from New York City. Amen. Praise God. And that's how I would act if I was God. But here's the thing. This is what I want you to get. Amen. God, share this with me. Amen. Amen. And, and he shares with me for my practice. Amen. Of law. Amen. There is no pardon without a conviction. You don't pardon innocent people. You don't pardon people that have been found not guilty. That's because the system has already adjudged their guilt and found their guilt to be lacking. The only people that get pardoned are those people who are convicted. 
In fact, uh, amen, uh, 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 President Biden, should this be his last, uh, 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 and I pray it's not, amen. So you know, amen, let me plug this, amen. Go register, go get your North Carolina IDs and go vote. You need your ID, they're $5. Go get a North Carolina ID. You don't even have to get a driver. It's a North Carolina ID so that you can vote. You can register to vote when you get your ID. So you can kill two birds and one stone. Amen. But should this be his last uh, uh, time in office, uh, many presidents will, one of the last thing they do is issue a pardon list, a, a list of people they're pardoned. Everyone on the list has been convicted of something. In fact, many of them have spent many years in jail. Well, here's the thing. For God, we always say that God pardoned the prisoners. And when we say that, we're talking about us. He's talking, we talk about God forgiving us of our sins, forgiving us of our wrongdoing. Well, here's the thing. Here's the thing. God, Jesus as God, when he says, I am thirsty, is sitting there as the judge and jury. He's passing judgment on on us because he is fulfilling scripture. In the scripture, Ramona talked about how the people mistreated and abused and harmed the king. So he's passing judgment on the people for, for treating him like this. But here is where I'm so glad, Sean. Here is where I celebrate my God because my God is not just the judge. He's not just the prosecutor. He's just not just the jury, but he is the criminal defense attorney. Amen. Praise God. And he just ain't any old criminal defense attorney. He is the criminal defense attorney. And the last time I checked, there is not a courtroom that he has ever been in that he has ever lost a case. Every single de cr criminal defendant he represented has been found not guilty. And they've been found not guilty, not because they were not guilty of the crime, not because the state lacked any evidence against them, not because the prosecuting witnesses failed to show up in court. No, they showed up in court. They testified to their best ability about everything we did wrong. But the reason why they were found not guilty is because the same defense attorney is the same judge. It's the same uh, executioner. And what happened, the same defense attorney spoke to himself and said, I know you want to find them guilty. I know you want to sentence them to death. But let me call upon your own leniency. Let me call upon your own favor. Let me call upon your own mercy and grace. And let me ask you to ask yourself to do for yourself for them what they cannot do for themselves and pardon them of the sins and the wrong they have done. That means that as you sit here right now, you are a person under pardon. That you are a person that has been forgiven of all you've done wrong. Don't you sit here and try to pretend like you've been married goody two shoes all your life. Let's be for real. Some of us were hellions. In fact, some of us are so bad that we were wearing gasoline draws on our way to hell. And if it had not been for the Lord on our side, where would we be now? Some of us have lied, some lies that will go down in the anal of lying. Amen. Some of us have stole some things that if we were, uh, if we were ever found out about, they will make a movie about us. Some of us have committed murder. I know you haven't actually pulled the trigger. I know you haven't actually suffocated anyone. I know you haven't actually strangled anyone anyone. But in your mind, Paul says, as long as you think it, you might as well should have done it because you're guilty of the same thing. That in your mind, you have murdered some people seven ways to Sunday. I know I'm not the only one. I know that I'm not the only one that sit here and says, if this person says one more thing to me, so help me God, I'm going to choke the you know what out of them. I'm going to choke them until they turn bluish purple. I'm going I'm, I'm, I'm to stump them. And then after all that, you got to say, 
God, please forgive me for thinking that. I know I'm not the only one. Amen. I'm just the one that's willing to be honest with you and transparent with you to say that I do it. And the, but the fact is, since we did it, we are criminals under judgment. But God loves us so much that he did not think it robbery to send his son down from heaven to die upon the cross so that whosoever shall believe in him shall not die but have everlasting life. I'm so glad he thirsts for righteousness and justice because remember one of the questions I asked at the beginning was why did he thirst? He thirsts for righteousness and justice so that God can fulfill righteousness and justice in that moment. Calvary not, doesn't isn't a moment of execution. Calvary is a moment of birth. If we really think about it, Calvary is a place we met Christ. And it's right there where we met Christ that we gained new life, that we were born again. So Calvary is not a place of death. Calvary is a place of birth. And if you've been reborn, if you've been rejuvenated, if you've been restored, if you've been renewed, if you've been renovated, if you've been rebuilt, if you've been reconformed, if you've been transformed, and you've been affirmed, and you've been confirmed, and you've been all that, then you understand what Calvary is. And because you understand what Calvary is, you can now walk your walk and talk your talk. You can now proceed down the road. You don't worry about what someone says to you. You don't worry about what someone thinks about you. Instead, you are only worried about how you can serve and bless the Lord God Almighty. You are only worried about how you can lift up God and magnify him. You are only worried about how you can bring glory to his name. And because that's how who you are now, that's indication that God satiated, that God fulfilled, that God quenched this thirst for righteousness, this thirst for justice that Jesus had. And if God has quenched that thirst in your life, and I know he has because guess what? You're sitting here just looking as healthy as you want to look. You ain't look like you missed any meals. You ain't look like you walked up in here from a hundred miles away. You ain't look like you slept on the street. You ain't look like you've been wearing the same clothes for the past three weeks. In fact, for some of y'all, this is the first time I'm seeing the outfit in four or five years. So I know God has been blessing you. God has been loving on you. God has been doing some incredible things in your life. And because he's doing that, you should be able to praise him, to glorify him, to magnify him, and to tell him, thank you for thirsting. Amen. 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 Lord, I don't took four minutes from Deacon uh, Rembrandt. Amen. I know how he, yeah, I know he gonna get me. Amen. He very stingy about his time. Amen. Praise God. But hopefully in that four minutes, someone learns something new about Jesus or something you've heard about Jesus finally settled in place and clicked. It finally made sense. And whatever that thing is, it was enough. Amen. It was enough to now make you say you want a relationship with Jesus. You want to be saved. Here's the thing. God wants you to be saved too. Doesn't matter what I think. Doesn't matter what anybody here thinks. God wants you to be saved too. And so you and him are in agreement. You're touching and agreeing. And we are coming alongside you and God hoping and praying 
that what you want, what he want, is what God realizes in your life. So let's not tarry. Let's not keep you from God any longer. I want you, in the privacy of your own heart, to pray this prayer with me. With all heads bowed and eyes closed, let us go to God in prayer. Dear Father God, creator of the heavens and the earth, we thank you, God, at this very moment. We thank you, God, for thirsting and hungering for righteousness. Is this thirst and hunger for righteousness that caused you to send Jesus to die for us in the first place? That God, you were fulfilling the prophecy in your scripture on the cross that day. That God, you were reminding creation that all things work for the good of those that love you and are called according to your purpose. That means every good thing and bad thing, every tender moment, every painful moment, Calvary was one of the things that worked together for the good of those that love you and are called according to your purpose purposes. Calvary happened. There's no question in our minds it happened. That's the settled truth. What's been lingering, what's been hanging out there is whether or not we were going to accept that truth as our own. Father God, right now we thank you for this word for God. It put some things into place so that we, God, can better understand, better know you and commit ourselves to you. Father God, at this point, we want to confess with our mouths because we believe in our hearts that Jesus is Lord to your glory. You did send him. He did live here. He was born through a woman. He was arrested, falsely accused, prosecuted, tried, convicted, sentenced to death, brutalized all night long, made forced to go to Calvary, to Golgotha, where they stretched him wide and hung him high. And he stayed there all day long until the time came for him to give up the ghost and to die. He was taken down. He was buried in a borrowed tomb. But early Sunday morning, you raised him, resurrected him from, from the dead with all power in his right hand. And currently he sits on the right hand side of your throne making intercession for me and for others. I confess Jesus Christ is Lord and I believe it in my heart. Now, God, I would ask that you would save me, that you would gather me, that you would bring me close to you so that, God, I may uh, live in a sustaining, productive relationship with you and that when and when my time is done, when my day is done and it all, it all has come to an end, I pray, God, that you would personally come down here and collect me and bring me back to heaven so that I may uh, uh, spend eternity with you. Father God, I pray that prayer not only for me, but I pray it for my neighbor who may be going through something similar or even the same thing. I pray, God, that you would have your way in all of our lives. It's in your son's mighty, matchless, marvelous, and magnificent name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Let me speak to someone here, uh, whether you're here in the sanctuary, you're home watching online through BotsCast, through YouTube, through uh, 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 Facebook, uh, Twitter, amen. I got us on everything, amen, praise God. Uh, however you're watching it right now, uh, you are saying, or you're one of the persons that had, today is the first day that you've accepted Christ. The first day you believe that you are a child of God and that you've accepted Christ.
we don't want you to be out here by yourself alone. We want to help you. This is a tremendous decision you've made, a tremendous thing you've done, and we want to help you grow in it, to help you become used to it. It's like uh, uh, trying on new shoes, amen. They hurt till you get them shoes comfortable to your feet, amen. It's like trying to ride a new bike. You don't just immediately get on the bike and start riding. You have to learn to balance, amen. And so we want to help you while you're learning how to spiritually balance as a new person, a new creature in Christ. We want to walk with you, help you grow, teach you, disciple you, so that the day will come when you will be a self-sustained, self-sufficient uh, disciple and steward of Christ. Amen. So this is what I want you to do. If you're brand new uh, to Christ, I want you to send me an email or uh, a private message, amen. They're going to show you on the screen uh, my email and private message. If you're on Facebook, just go to my Facebook page. It's My name is Al Kennon, K-E-N-N-O-N. If you don't want to uh, send me a private mes message on Facebook or you're not on Facebook, you can email me. My email address is pastor, P-A-S-T-O-R-A-L, K-E-N-N-O-N-I-I-I -N -N -I -I at gmail.com. Pastor Al Kennan III, P-A-S-T-O-R-A-L-K-E-N-N-O-N-I-I-I -N -N -I -I at gmail.com. Send me the email. Tell me that you've accepted Christ for the very first time today, and we'll get busy uh, walking together, growing and developing you into that which God has called you to be as a Christian and a believer. Amen. Pray. There it is. There's the screen with the uh, email and my Facebook profile on there. Amen. Keep it up there for a second while I issue the second call, uh, Deke. Uh, amen. Praise God. For some people, it's not the issue is not whether or not you've accepted Christ for Christ for the first time today. You've accepted Christ. The problem is because of COVID nineteen and other conditions, you have uh, uh, di disconnected yourself from the church. You're not connected to a church. You're not a member of a body of believers. Well, check this out. You can't grow disconnected from the vine. Yeah, you'll ripen, but ripen is really another way of saying, okay, you're dying. We want you to stay connected to the vine. And the only way to stay connected is to physically connect yourself with, a vine, with the vine. Come down here, worship with us. Amen. I don't know if I shared this with you before. Had a chance to go uh, to several concerts. One of the concerts I went to was see Jay-Z live. I love Jay-Z. I mean, I love Jay. My wife loves Beyonce, so we have the arguments over who's the real mover and shaker in that family. Amen. I love Jay-Z. Uh, and it's one thing to have my playlist on my iPod and my cell phone with all the Jay-Z songs. It was another thing to see it in person, to see him perform in person, to see him riff, to see him change things up, to see him perform the way he needed to perform. What I'm saying to you is one thing to watch us online. One thing to watch us on the screen. It's quite another thing to watch us in person, to be here in person. There's just an electricity and energy that you get from being in the place. That happens when you connect yourself with us. So this is what I want you to do. Amen. I want you to put a tickler on your phone. Amen. I want you to go to your calendar on your cell phone. That's why you got this $1,000 phone. Amen. And I want you for next Sunday, block off 10 to 12. Amen. And I want you to put in there church at First Fellowship Charlotte. And I want you to set the reminder for two days and one day. So that you get reminded two days out and the day before. And then I want you to plan to come, come be here to get what God has, has for you, all 
right? Amen. Amen. Let's do this. Uh, we're going to shut this.